let's talk about another transition in your life, the decision to move back to the Philippines and get into an industry that was still in its infancy. Going home was just a byproduct of it, you know, uh, but having the opportunity to run a company, or just SPI at the yes. time, which I found to have fantastic foundations, people who were so passionate about their work, people who were so passionate about serving the consumer, right? It, it, it allowed me the chance to build that business up from um, a keyboarding operation to a full-fledged publishing BPO, legal BPO, medical BPO. And, um, you know, it was that temptation. And then also the opportunity, like you said, of seeing an industry that said, you know what, this could work, right? Um, a lot of my thinking starts that it could work, right? You know, the concept of using Filipino labor, uh, low-cost, fantastic labor, well-educated labor, to do work in the U.S., right? At a time when connectivity was also coming down in price. And at the same time also, you had you know, countervailing force of a diaspora leaving. Did that, that come into your mind about keeping jobs here in the Philippines? Well, while not, not so answers? much because the thing was, the work was low end yet, mm -hmm. so still at the low end. Uh, towards maybe three or four years into my career, we started to bring back the diaspora to work for SPI and help build the BPO industry, right? But the concept really of, of lower cost, highly educated labor, doing work in the U.S., right, for the U.S. So we kind of figured out the different angles where you could transport the work electronically, right? And it just blossomed into what is today the BPO industry. Well, one of the things about putting the building blocks together in the industry is working with different stakeholders. How did you bring it all together to grow an industry that's really dependent on people as its backbone? Well, first of all, the government, they, they stayed away, you know. They and say fair is good. Yeah, right? fair is good, <laughs> and, uh, you know, except for the PESA. The PESA assisted us in getting the incentives we needed, yes. uh, helping us get this accreditation that would give us tax incentives and also import tax incentives on VAT. Uh, that was a very good process. Uh, there was no issues there. Um, and the rest were the schools, like you said. So we tried to hire the best. Imagine when we started the call center business called eTelecare back in 99, 2000. Uh, we only accepted people from the top schools in the Philippines, right? We had that luxury because we were the only ones. We were the first. We, when people, when we said call center, thought you went there to make calls overseas. Sure. You know, they didn't realize it was for customer care. You know, we were very fortunate that our, one of our very first clients was American Express. You know, and that sort of sealed our credibility and the industry that... Well, you had a, you had a marquee and anchor name already with you. Absolutely, and that's always necessary when you're starting up, right? Someone like a Fortune 500 company would give you that seal of approval, uh, make that leap of faith that doing work in the Philippines is all right. You know, so th that kind of helped us uh, as we went along, right? But the transition going out of that industry and, and, you know, having the, let's say, sensibility to sell it at the right time, what were your decision drivers for that and how do you think you left the industry? Well, it was an understanding of what your investors' needs are, right? At that point in time, I believe when we sold it, uh, it they were already in the, in the company for about eight years or so. It was time to give them an exit and a good exit. And then um, management decided that we would roll over a lot of our holdings, right? To give them the confidence that we weren't exiting. It was a way to facilitate the exit of the early investors into the company. Because all of these funds have lives, you know? Yeah. So, and if you didn't do that and didn't get, get them the refresh that they needed or the company needed, you would get a lot of pressure. Yeah. And then the second time around, it was really just understanding where the market was headed. And I think maybe that's, that's the uncanny ability um, to be able to see where the peaks were, right? Because we did sell SPI once again, um, ironically enough, to our competitor, uh, PLDT, um, at a very good price, at the, a very good time in the market. How do you ensure that you yourself or your succession team looks at trends from a long-term point of view to the point that you're able to capitalize them and rather, be, rather than be a me too, r also ran company in terms of looking at and capitalizing on, on these trends? Well, it starts off with the principle, right? That if it's already being done, it's probably too late. I like to do things that's not been done before. I like to do things that are difficult to do uh, because that increases the barrier to entry. So I try to, to anticipate what c we can differentiate, differentiate on um, and also be ahead, right? And you can only be ahead if you understand where the customer's going, right? So it's, it's a lot of observation. Observation in developed markets, because developed markets are a good crystal ball to what happens in emerging markets, right? It's just a matter of time. And comparing notes exactly where it is. Yeah, and, and eventually with some adaptation. And really observing what are the, who are the prime movers, what segments, who are the dec decision makers ultimately, who will shape the opinion about that particular segment or that sector, right? 
The other thing that I, I also believe in is that don't be afraid of disruption. You know, a lot of companies say, oh, don't do that, because if you do that, we will lose our revenue that we've been doing for so many years. Or, and, and they go, you know, my philosophy is if you don't do it, somebody will. I mean, we've had companies that have we've shown that, right? People either get complacent, people who don't believe um, that progress can be made in their industry, and people are trying to protect traditional revenue streams. You know, I call it achieving the Kodak moment. Actually. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and where are they now, right? Yeah, exactly. They're a patent company. <laughs> yeah. Globe taking you as your CEO. Tell us about what, at what point did you feel that you were prepared to take this leap? Uh, obviously, it was a great offer, but did you have to bridge a skill set to get into the CEO position and to translate that vision you had in the BPO industry into a major telecoms company? Well, actually, you know, the, the, the Globe decision was an 18 month journey. Uh, I had a very, you would say, great uh, point in my life where I had the opportunity to stay with SPI, um, start a new private equity fund, which I really wanted to do, and had the Globe job offer at the same time. I mean, how many times in your life... Well, nice problem to have, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is uh, to have a great set of choices uh, like that. It, it's almost like a dream, you know, when it happened. And I chose where my heart really was at that point in time and chose uh, that, that I would raise a fund. You know, so we created Aligned Capital uh, with a partner of myself and proceeded to raise money for about um, six months. And in the three month period, we were able to raise about $80 million out of our 200 million that we were going to use for growth capital uh, around the region. You know. And the countries we focused on were Philippines, India, and Vietnam, uh, where we had done business uh, prior uh, in, our, in our prior careers. And, um, Fortunately with, and unfortunately, we raised the money and then the market fell out, right, with the Lehman crisis well, and, was and it Wall Street. was beyond your control at that time. At that point it was. And, um, and really, private equity fell out of favor. When private equity fell out of favor, nobody would take our calls anymore. Sure. And, uh, and, you know, I, I had to go back to my investors and Ayala was one of my investors and said, hey, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. And that's when they came back and said, would you reconsider the Globe position, which was 18 months after. And at that point, I was slowly, slowly getting bored. I was 18 months out of work already, you know, enjoying my life. Uh, but I said, maybe it's time for a new challenge. And I took the challenge of Globe on. I think people should not always conclude that the solution is actually a third player. For the third player to be the solution, the third player has to be more innovative than the two incumbents.